worry about the ICU beds because we won't have our elderly and our people at the greatest risk having to be hospitalized. And on the PPE, Dr. Burks, can we ask you to comment on the on the Go ahead. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, very productive call today uh, with governors. We talked about uh, the new rollout of the testing that we described yesterday and the drive-through and community-based testing. And I know how grateful the president is for the the efforts that uh, governors are making, and now uh, with the Admiral and, and uh, uh, the United States uh, Public Health Service, as well as FEMA, we made great progress today in coordinating those efforts. But the other issue that was raised with the President today was personal protective equipment. And the reason I mentioned testing is because one of the recommendations that we have for states is that these remote testing sites make a priority of two groups. One would be people over the age of 65 that have symptoms. We don't want them to go to hospitals or emergency rooms. We want them to go to a remote site in a parking lot or at an isolated community location. But the other category is our health care workers. We want to make sure that our health care workers have the opportunity to be tested. And using that new high-throughput test that the President arranged with our major commercial labs, uh, we'll be able to do that much more expeditiously. So we're putting a real priority on our extraordinary health care workers that are, that are at this very hour coming alongside people that are struggling with the coronavirus and people that are concerned that they may have been exposed. The other piece is uh, we're grateful uh, that the legislation passed uh, by the House of Representatives uh, includes liability protection for N95 masks produced by companies like 3M in Minnesota, by Honeywell, uh, literally tens of millions of masks are produced every year for industrial purposes, for construction. But the health experts say they can be used just as readily to protect health care workers from respiratory ailments. Uh, 3M and other companies were not able to sell those to hospitals, but the President negotiated with the Democratic leadership of the House and Senate. We've added a provision to the bill that will literally, from one company alone, add another 30 million masks per month back to the marketplace. We're strengthening the supply chain, uh, and healthcare workers around America can be absolutely certain that the President and our entire team are going to continue to put the health of America first and put first our healthcare workers across this country that are meeting the needs of the people of our country. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President how many test kits have been sent out and how many people can actually be tested? I think the Admiral can answer that. And you might want to talk about the roving. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, we're re really entering a new phase of testing. Um, at first, we were at the initial phase where the CDC developed test was only available in public health laboratories in the CDC. Works very well for a few thousand tests per day after it gets running. We're now moving into a phase that the big commercial laboratories with high throughput screening have availability. So um, as we talked about last week, because of the historic efforts of the FDA, a Roche test and, as the President predicted, a Thermo Fisher test were both produced last week under an emergency use authorization. 1.9 million of those tests will be sequentially into the ecosystem this week. From the information we have right now, 1 million tests are available with all the reagents, everything ready to go primarily at the reference labs called Quest, LabCorp, and a couple others. Now, it doesn't matter if they're not in your neighborhood, because every day when people get tests, a little white box goes out in front, it gets shipped uh, by an incredible distribution system, the test result, and it's electronically reported. So these are available to people nationwide. We expect more and more than one million coming on board this week as the reagents come up and as people uh, with the testing capacity validate that in their own hospitals and other and other places. And in the future, we expect at least 2 million next week and at least 5 million the week thereafter. There are also a whole uh, growth of what's called laboratory uh, determined testing or laboratory derived testing where uh, individual laboratories, because of the regulatory deregulation of the FDA, can develop their own tests and start using them. So if you're a CLIA certified lab, with complexity, you can do that. So the point is, testing is now entering sort of what we normally do in the healthcare system, 
where big labs in a high throughput basis receive these through normal channels. So that part of it is, is really underway. But do you know how many Americans have actually been tested? Do you have a number? Uh, there is a number. I don't have that number because I've been working on setting up this distribution system. So this is where we are. The state and public health laboratories in the CDC are published every day on the CDC website. The CDC gets feeds from lab uh, from LabCorp and Quest, and they get that on a daily basis. What is not being received right now, and Ambassador Burks is fixing, is that these uh, homegrown tests in highly complex labs don't necessarily get reported in the system. However, as we move forward, particularly in the high in the, the commercial phase of where we are right now, we expect about 80 to 85 percent of the tests to flow right into the CDC. We know them. That's not good enough for Ambassador Burke. She wants 100, and we'll work on that. Sir, are you so, I think just to put it a different way, a lot of, a lot of testing has been going on, and uh, I don't believe anybody has been able to do what we're doing and what we will be doing. And let me just say that um, we talked about the drive-through testing yesterday. I want it to be clear to everybody, this is just another tool for states and local public health systems and health care systems to use. It's not replacing testing that it goes on in a doctor's office or in a hospital, or if you go to your doctor and wants to get tested in that office. This is just another tool that we're helping the states to have. Um, and again, as we talked about, uh, this is uh, modeled on the uh, FEMA-based points of distribution system, optimized for testing. Um, we expect uh, this week uh, we now have uh, gear, people being shipped right now today that will be in over 12 states uh, with multiple sites, many of, many of states having multiple sites, to start augmenting the local capacity and really providing the state and the local people what they need as another way for people to get tested. Mr. 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 So, so this has never been done before. That's never been done, and certainly not on a level like that. And, and I will say that um, I think I can speak for the professionals that uh, if you don't have the symptoms, if your doctor doesn't think you need it, don't get the test. Don't get the test. I think it's very important. Not everybody should run out and get the test. That's right. But we're able to handle uh, tremendous numbers of people. Uh, John? Mr. President, earlier today, uh, Governor Cuomo of New York said that uh, he believes that hosp hospital capacity soon will be overwhelmed and implored you to call on the Army Corps of Engineers to build temporary facilities to house patients. Is that something we're looking into say? it? We've heard that. We've heard it from. Uh, really two places. There are two places that have uh, specifically New York being one, uh, and we are looking into it very strongly. Yeah. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. Steve, go ahead, please. Sir, how have you changed your own behavior to take account of this virus? Have you, are you washing your hands more? Oh, you I've mean? always washed my hands a lot. I wash my hands a lot, probably, uh, maybe, if anything, more. Certainly not less. What was it like uh, taking the test? Not, not, uh, something I want to do every day, I can tell you that. It's, a, you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit of, a, of good doctors in the White House, but it's a test. It's a test. It's a medical test. Nothing pleasant about it. You had said that uh, in a tweet that Governor Cuomo should be doing more. What well, I think he can do more. What specifically but I think, should he I, be doing? I think he can do more. And, you know, it's an area of the uh, country that's very hot right now. I think uh, New Rochelle, and a place I know very well. I grew up right near New Rochelle. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very — no, I think it's a, an area that has to be tamped down even more, because it's a hotbed. There's no question about it. So I think they can look at doing it. But we're getting along very well. We've had a very uh, — in fact, I noticed you made some statements uh, just now that uh, the relationship with the federal government has been good. The federal government has done everything they've wanted us to do. Uh, but we can uh, — uh, I think I think it's very important that all of the governors get along very well with us, and that we get along with the governors. And I think that's happening. The defense secretary and the assistant defense secretary have de decided to separate and be in a bubble to avoid the spread of the disease and to protect the chain of command. Is that something you and the vice president should be doing? And has there been any talk about having to have a twenty fifth amendment? Well, we haven't thought place? of it, but you know, I will say this that. Uh, uh, it's uh, — we're very careful. We're very careful with, with, you know, being together. Even the people behind me are, are very — they've been very strongly tested. I've been very strongly tested. 
And we have to be very careful. But everybody should be v vigilant. We have to be vigilant. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Two, two simple questions for you, Mr. President. Go ahead, please. Two, two simple questions for you, Mr. President. Hold it, hold it, hold it before you. Okay. I don't know if this is a question for you or for Dr. Burke, but Dr. Burke said that it is the millennials who are going to lead us through this and that now is the time to look out for the older people in our home. Older might be a state of mind, not necessarily an age. So for those millennials of us who have parents who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, what is older? What should we tell them at this point? Well, if I was Dr. Fauci, I would tell you there's a physiologic age and a numerical age. Um, so older people with pre-existing conditions, um, and what do we mean by that? You know, significant heart disease, significant kidney disease, significant lung disease, any immunosuppression, any recent treatment for cancer, any of those pieces in any household. Now, why do I think the millennials are the key? Because they're the ones that are out and about. And they're the most likely to be in social gatherings. And they're the most likely to be the least symptomatic. And I think we've always heard about the greatest generation. We're protecting the greatest generation right now and the children of the greatest generation. And I think the millennials can help us tremendously by having, a, plus they need to communicate with each other. Public health people like myself don't always come out with compelling and exciting messages that a 25 to 35 year old may find interesting and something they will take to heart. But millennials can speak to one another about how important it is in this moment to protect all of the people. Now, you could be 40 and have a significant medical condition and be of substantial risk. You could be 30 and having come through Hodgkin's disease or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and be of a significant risk. So there are risk groups in every age group, but the age, there's more millennials now than any other cohort, and they can help us at this moment. Mr. President, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. You already talked. Mr. President, the other day you said that you were not responsible for the testing shortfall. Very simple question. Does the buck stop with you? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your response to this crisis? I'd rate it a 10. I think we've done a great job. And it started with the fact that we kept a very highly infected country despite all of the, even the professionals uh, saying, no, it's too early to do that. We were very, very early with respect to China, and we would have a whole different situation in this country if we didn't do that. I would rate it a, a very, very, I would rate ourselves and, and the professionals. I think the professionals have done a fantastic job. As far as the testing, you heard the Admiral. I think the, the testing that we've done, we, we really took over an obsolete system or uh, put it maybe in a different way, a system that wasn't meant to do anything like this. We took it over, and we're doing something that's never been done in this country. And I think that uh, we are doing very well. We took the system, we worked with the system we had, and uh, we broke down the system purposely. We broke it down in order to do what we're doing now. And within a short period of time, and even now, we're testing tremendous numbers of people. And ultimately, you're saying it will be what? It will be up to how many people will be, we be able to test? We, cer we certainly expect, with the high-throughput testing, that that's no longer a barrier. Um, the barrier is actually doing the test on a person, and I'm sure, as the President will, would inform you, in order to do the test, a health care provider needs to dress in full personal protective equipment, uh, full personal protective equipment. And there's a swab that's put in the back of the nose all the way to the back of the throat. It's called a nasopharyngeal swab, which is then put in media. The next person who has to get tested, that health care provider has to change all the personal protective equipment. When you put that in, it's highly likely a person coughs or sneezes, so you're at risk. So that's what we're trying to fix now by the mobile platforms, by all the things we're doing, is to enable sort of high throughput of this swabbing. And we're doing some technological things, too, that might be breakthroughs to make it much, much faster. But we certainly expect that from thousands of people per day, we will, we will be at the tens of thousands of people per day uh, this week, according to those who are... Well, does the buck stop with you, Mr. President? Does the buck stop with you? Yeah, normally, but I think uh, when you hear the... Uh, you know, this has never been done before in this country. If you look uh, back, you know, take a look at some of the things that took place in uh, 09 or 11 or whatever it may have been, uh, they never did. Nobody's ever done anything like 
what we're doing. Now, I, I will also say, uh, Admiral, I think we can say that we're also getting this ready for the future, so that when we have a future problem, if and when, and hopefully we don't have anything like this, but if there is, we're going to be very uh, — we're going to be starting off from a much higher plateau, because we were at a very, very low base. We had a uh, a system that was not meant for this. It was a, a smaller system. It was uh, meant for a much different purpose. And for that purpose, it was fine, but not for this purpose. So we broke down the system, and now we have something that's going to be and, — and is very special and is ready for future problems. I think we can say that very strongly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Yes. How close are you to shutting down America's northern border with Canada? And could you also uh, speak to the fact about the elections that are supposed to be taking place tomorrow? Is it your advice that those states postpone those elections? Well, I'd leave that up to the states. It's a big thing, postponing an election. I think, to me, that uh, really uh, goes to the heart of what we're all about. I think postponing an election is a very tough thing. I know they're doing — because they've been in touch with us — they're doing it very carefully. Uh, they're spreading people out very — at great distances, as you can see. Uh, and uh, I think they'll do it very safely. I hope they do it very safely. But I think postponing elections is a very uh, — it's not a very good thing. They have lots of room in a lot of the electoral places. And I think that uh, they will do it very well. But I think postponing is unnecessary. On the northern border, sir, how uh, close are you to shutting We think about down? it. We think about it. If we don't have to do it, that'll be — Good. We have very strong emergency powers when it comes to something like this, both on the southern and the northern borders. And we uh, we are talking about different things, but we'll see. Right now, we have not decided to do that, Steve. Can we get Dr. Fauci to talk about the vaccine trial today and, and whether the timetable for vaccine has — is it possible to accelerate? Is it still 12 to 18 months? So, thank you for that question. The vaccine candidate that was given the first injections for the first person took place today. You might recall when we first started, I said it would be two to three months. And if we did that, that would be the fastest we've ever gone from obtaining the sequence to being able to do a phase one trial. This has been now 65 days, which I believe is the record. Uh, what it is, it's a trial of 45 normal individuals between the ages of 18 and 55. The trial is taking place in Seattle. There will be two uh, injections, one at zero day, first one, then 28 days. There will be three separate doses, 25 milligrams, 100 milligrams, 250 milligrams, and the individuals will be followed for one year, both for safety and whether it induces the kind of response that we predict would be protective. And that's exactly what I've been telling this group over and over again. So it's happened. The first injection was today. Sir, the market just closed down 3,000, almost 13 percent. Your response to the market closed, sir? Is there, thank you. Dr. Fauci, is there guidance for someone who may have felt sick but then feels better, so you had symptoms but no, you no longer do, your fever's gone away? How long would you stay home after that point? That's not clear from the guidance. Well, if you, are, if you are positive for the infection, if you have coronavirus, it is less how you feel than whether or not you're still shedding virus. So the general issue about letting people out of a facility, who, for example, a hospital or whatever, who have been infected, you need two negative cultures, the same way that was just described, 24 hours apart. Yeah, no, the, market, the market will take care of itself. The market will be... Uh, very strong as soon as we get rid of the uh, virus. Yes. Could you clarify about pregnant women? Is that an underlying? Because the UK said today that pregnancy was one of those underlying conditions. Do we say that too? There's very little data in pregnant women. I think I, about a week ago I said the reports that came in from China, um, from the Chinese CDC, of the nine women who were documented. You are currently watching a news conference, a uh, uh, press conference. Stage on the latest uh, of the coronavirus coverage that we are doing right now. We're going to switch it on over uh, to our local leadership, Mayor Latoya Cantrell in front of City Hall, updating us on how the city is actively fighting coronavirus. Let's take a quick listen in. All right. Trying to show some social distancing. Amen. 
Well, good afternoon and thank you all so much for being here. I'm joined by the public safety team, department leadership, New Orleans City Council, uh, leadership, community leadership. And we are all here uh, to give you, I will give you a brief update on some changes that are being made relative to a proclamation that I just signed off on and has now uh, been filed within the civil district court. And I'm going to read specifically from the proclamation to be very clear about what it says. And it's whereas residents of, of and visitors to Orleans Parish should take personal responsibility to prevent the further spread of COVID-19 including but not limited to avoiding gatherings and practicing social distancing. Whereas all businesses, colleges and universities should scale down operations to prevent the further spread of COVID-19. All public and private gatherings shall be canceled or prohibited in non-emergency situations where possible. In limited circumstances, personal gatherings should be limited to the number of persons in a reasonable household size. This shall not apply to, to health care facilities, pharmacies, grocery stores, corner stores, banks, gas stations, and other essential service providers. Loitering outside of any of these essential service providers again shall be prohibited. Bars, health clubs, this includes gyms and fitness centers, shopping centers configured as malls. This is like Riverwalk. This is like Canal Place in the city of New Orleans. Live performance venues, reception facilities, and other establishments where large gatherings routinely occur and or where the risk of the spread of COVID-19 can exist. And so these operations uh, shall cease. Further, restaurants as defined in our CZO ordinance, that's that comprehensive zoning ordinance, shall limit their operations to takeout and delivery only, even pickup including the sale of alcohol in accordance with the city and state issued permits. So this, everything I just read is embedded in a proclamation that was filed prior to this press conference. The city of New Orleans continues to urge, and really we say that Cox Communications cannot do it alone when we speak about activating citywide public Wi-Fi stations across the city. So we're really asking for all of our providers to double down and to do what it takes to turn on public Wi-Fi and remove your data limits so that our people can have the access needed for many different reasons, just to stay in the communication as well as our students who are on distant learning curriculums. At this time and before, you know, I'll come back in and out, but I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Jennifer Avegno to give us a further update. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been here every day and I've said the same thing. This is a rapidly changing situation, as you see, not only for New Orleans, but all across the U.S. and the world. Um, we continue to be and are increasingly very concerned by the number of cases of COVID-19 that we're seeing here in New Orleans. There is substantial community spread that has already resulted in two deaths. And it continues to appear that the rate of infection here is increasing much faster than even other cities in the U.S. Additional testing that we are trying to ramp up will help us better compare what's happening to here to other places around the world. But for now, we need to proceed as if this high increase rate is real. For that reason, as the mayor said, we are taking the necessary action now to limit further spread. And we are doing this with a public health lens. 
The mandatory closing of entertainment facilities will help limit the interaction of large groups of people and slow the spread of the virus. To be clear, there are essential services that are not included in this closure, such as healthcare facilities, pharmacies, grocery stores, and banks. The number one way to limit the spread of a virus is to take personal responsibility and to do what needs to be done that you can do to protect your community. We are asking you to make significant changes to your daily life by limiting the number of people you are interacting with. Public and private gatherings should be canceled. Personal gatherings, and what I mean by that is what you might do in your house or on your own time. These should be no larger than what a reasonable household size of individuals would be. We know that cases among the elderly and the chronically ill are great concern and growing. As you know, there are a number of cases at senior living facilities, and those concern us very much. These are the people who are at the greatest risk of, of illness and severe illness. However, I want to get the message to our young, healthy community. You are still at significant risk of contracting the disease. While you will very likely have mild symptoms, you can spread it to those who, if infected, face serious illness or death. I continue to stress how important it is what we are, what we are telling you here. Every single person plays a role in the health of our community and the decisions you make today, tomorrow, next week, and while we get through this, will either save lives or not. Please continue to practice social distancing by avoiding close contact with others. Wash your hands regularly. Stay home if you are sick. If you are elderly or have significant medical conditions, we are asking you to limit the amount of time you spend in a public space. The health department is working continuously with our hospitals and healthcare facilities. Again, what we know around the world is that as the rate of infection increases, healthcare facilities can be overwhelmed very quickly. This is what we are trying to avoid. Our healthcare workers are on the front lines of this. We're speaking to hospitals and they understand and are planning for an increase in patients and, and their capacity being stretched. We are prepared with our state and federal partners to leverage as much as we can to help them with that. We're building a network of licensed medical and behavioral health volunteers. So if that's you, we might need you in the future. Please sign up at ready.nola.gov to volunteer. These are difficult times. We truly appreciate everyone's attention and cooperation to get through this together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. And to speak directly to, uh, as we talk about uh, not only homelessness, but our vulnerable populations of people and being mindful of this as we're able to meet their needs and also ensure that we have surge capacity for all of our populations of people. I'm going to ask uh, Director Colin Arnold of Homeland Security to come forth and give us an update. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As the mayor and Dr. Avegno stated, it's incredi incredibly important that you heed these instructions at this time. These are indeed extreme measures that we need to put in place to protect the health of our community. The New Orleans Police Department, the Louisiana State Police, and all law enforcement in the area will be strictly enforcing these closures. But we ask now, as we've been asking all week, that you do your part to slow the spread of this virus. The city's emergency operations center remains activated where public safety and public health liaisons are coordinating the city's response to this ongoing situation. The Louisiana National Guard is offering support in the EOC as well as other state, regional, and federal partners. As we announced yesterday, we're working with the federal government, Health and Human Services, on a pilot program to expand COVID-19 testing. This is a regional pilot and will focus on testing individuals who are at the greatest risk of exposure and severe illness. These details are still being worked out as we speak and I'll share more information as it's developed. We all know that the business closures we're mandating will be felt throughout the community for some time. The city has compiled a list of resources for impacted employees and businesses. It's available at ready.nola.gov. 
The Louisiana Workforce Commission is offering unemployment insurance to qualifying individuals. We've made a formal request to the state to open Small Business Administration economic injury disaster loans for businesses in the region, and we expect that to move forward. It is with the state. The New Orleans Business Alliance has set up a dedicated relief fund to meet the needs of gig economy workers directly affected by this. First and second city court have suspended all residential evictions until April 24th with further orders to follow. And the city's Office of Community Development has partnered with the Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, Togo Community Action, and the New Orleans Family Justice Alliance to provide immediate financial and legal system, assistance to prevent homelessness. That includes rental assistance and foreclosure mitigation. There are a number of feeding resources available to people in need, including the, the school needs feeding program, Second Harvest Food Bank, and Meals on Wheels. And we've already said power, water, and telecommunications utility providers will ensure efficient and uninterrupted service during this time. On the public safety side, we continue to be all hands on deck to this outbreak. Our public safety agencies are well equipped. They have personal protective equipment and will be utilizing it as necessary. 911 call takers are trained to ask specific questions to determine if calls for assistance might be from a COVID-19 patient. It's incredibly important that you're honest and open and thoughtful about your responses to 911 operators. Answer their questions completely. Please do not send first responders into a situation that they do not know what they're getting into. It will also aid in treating you, which is the primary concern. It's also incredibly important that we reserve all emergency services for those who really need them. If you have a fever, cough, or shortness of breath, stay home and call your doctor. Only use 911 for hos and hospitals for life-threatening emergencies. And finally, as I have said over the days, there is a lot of misinformation and rumor that is going on right now. Please pay attention. Information is the most vital way that we will get through this. Make sure you are getting accurate information from reliable sources, including the CDC, the Louisiana Department of Health, and here in New Orleans, at NOLA Ready. You can text COVID NOLA, one word, to 888-777. You can follow us on social media at NOLA Ready, and you can go to ready.nola.gov for updates. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Colin. I would now uh, ask for our superintendent of the New Orleans Police Department to come forth and give us an update as well. Thank you, Mayor. New Orleans Police Department would like to first start by thanking our business owners, our business leaders, as well as our community and citizens for your cooperation thus far. But we have much more work to be done. We're urging our business leaders and business owners to comply with the order as we continue our efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19. New Orleans Police Department will be strictly enforcing the recent shutdown orders given by our mayor as well as by our governor. This includes bars, restaurants, nightclubs, ABOs, casinos, gyms, health clubs. Dine-in service at restaurants will be prohibited. However, we will allow takeout services, delivery services, as well as drive-through services. Enforcement by the New Orleans Police Department will be acting as the eyes and ears on the street for our permit division to identify those who are non-compliant. New Orleans Police Department is ready and prepared to take immediate action. Businesses that refuse to comply with the report or with the orders that are given will be reported to city permits for appropriate action to be taken further down the line. That does include and does not limit with the reduction or the taking of your permits if necessary. If you want to keep your license to operate, we urge you to comply with this order throughout this process. This is incredibly serious that we fight together to slow down the spread of this virus. With restaurants closing, we encourage everyone to have adequate food and resources on hand. Grocery stores will remain open in order for citizens and visitors to purchase needed items. We also discourage and we will be enforcing any loitering around these businesses. We encourage personal accountability. We encourage personal responsibility. We must do this together. We all have a role in ensuring the safety of this city. I want to again thank the members of the business community, 
thank the citizens of our great city for their support in these challenging times. Working together, we can and we will slow down the spread of COVID-19 and help stabilize the health and well-being of the city of New Orleans. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Chief. Before I bring up uh, our partner, uh, Dr. Rebecca Gee, uh, I do want to just uh, restate that the city hall, city government is still in operations. Uh, today we uh, went forward with our minimal access with the main entrance being here at Perdido. We were able to activate temperature checks for both employees and visitors alike. We know that over 1,600 were tested and we had no uh, positive, and what I mean by that, temperature, temperature checks, uh, which is a, uh, is a sign or a symptom as it relates to high temperatures related to, um, related to COVID-19. Uh, so we are open for business. We have been able to effectively serve our residents, but we are also improving our function so that residents will not have to come to city government for permitting or any other uh, reasons. However, uh, we will be open and government is running. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask our health partner of LSU, Dr. Rebecca Gee, uh, to come forward at this time. Doctor. Thank you, Mayor, and I'm, I'm proud to stand with you and your tremendous leadership and Dr. Avegno. Both of you have shown firm, decisive action at such challenging times. This will save lives. You've made uh, tremendous progress, but these are challenging times. And as CEO of LSU Healthcare Services, I just want to reassure you as the flagship university of this region, with our dentists, our nurses, our allied health professionals, our public health professionals, we stand ready to care for you. We are rapidly deploying telemedicine resources and uh, the ability for patients to be able to see doctors remotely um, through telemedicine assets. We are looking to see how we can use our research capacity and our facilities to help solve this problem. We are partnering with groups like Amazon and with Google to look at deploying the most innovative technology solutions for this problem. So as, as a university, um, we are, and with, as healthcare providers, we are very um, capable and glad to be able to help, but again, have tremendous confidence in the mayor and Dr. Avegno. And in addition, I think we need to give gratitude to the governor for the Medicaid expansion. If we had what we started with in 2016, which is one in four adults uninsured, we would be facing a much greater problem than we do now with an 8% uninsurance rate. So do take care of yourselves. Don't overwhelm health care groups because you haven't had your flu shot because you're not taking care of yourselves. Um, and if you have mental health issues, you can look to LSU Health Network. You can look to volunteer networks, but definitely don't overwhelm unless you are truly sick and need health care. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gee. Now, I would like uh, to hear, for you all to hear, uh, directly from our city council members uh, who have been very much engaged uh, throughout this response effort. I'm going to call on council member Moreno uh, to start us off. Council member. Well, good afternoon. Uh, the steps that are being taken, um, the precautionary step steps are really uh, critical toward uh, slowing down the spread of, of COVID-19. and. Um, whether it's the closures of the restaurants to the precautions that we're taking here at City Hall. You're probably seeing the, the red dots and that's the, the dot that indicates that our temperature has been taken and, and that we've been cleared to enter the building. I wanted to just quickly go over uh, some questions that council offices have received uh, just to, for clarification purposes. We've received uh, questions uh, based on, these, on, on some of these closures as to what other types of business that are not businesses that are not impacted as to how they should be uh, conducted their their work days and so after um, talking with with Dr. Avegno that, that what's recommended is that for those who can work from home to work from home uh, if businesses uh, for some reason can, cannot have their employees work from home then ensure that in your office space that there is enough distancing between uh, employees so that you do keep that social distancing um, measure, measure um, in place as well. Uh, we've also been hearing a lot about um, assistance for, for people who may end up getting laid off or, or lose their jobs. I actually just saw it come across uh, on NOLA.com that it appears Gail Benson has made a $1 million contribution to aid uh, with, with workers who may be impacted. And so that is really tremendous. 
Uh, we, uh, in coordination with the mayor's office, have been in touch, of course, with Louisiana Workforce and uh, obviously encouraging those individuals who may be impacted with job losses to sign up for unemployment benefits. Um, but, but let me just say that, that with that being said, uh, there is a bit of a gap right now between when you sign up and then when your paperwork is processed. That timeline is ordinarily around 21 days. It has been reduced, but there's still a bit of a, of a gap. So we are asking um, those who can um, to, at the end of the day, help us with the creation of a fund, whether it's through nonprofits or NOLA BA or whoever it may be with, um, to help us with that gap funding in between from when uh, those individuals are laid off to when their unemployment benefits can kick in. So those are some of the items that we are um, right now working on. And then one last thing. So since we are encouraging, obviously, restaurants to continue to um, be able to do business so that they can do business through takeout or through delivery, uh, we started to, to wonder about, well, what about the different apps that are already out there, like Uber Eats and Waiter, that are doing delivery services? Uh, what we have found out is that those particular companies are taking additional sanitation steps for food delivery, and they're also now putting in place on their apps that if you're getting food from them, that, 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 you, that, that you can request for the food to just be left on your doorstep so that you have no contact, individual contact, with the, with the person who is delivering the food. So those are just some updates that we have. And just, you know, we just encourage the public to continue to email and to call city council offices because we are open. We are conducting most of our business, obviously, through uh, phone and through email. But we are open to answer constituent questions questions and do everything that we can to, to help the public as we all work to get through this together. Thank yeah, you, ma'am. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thank you so much. And I'll ask uh, Councilmember Williams to come up and give you some updates as well. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you, team. Uh, first, let me personally thank all of our health care professionals who are just going above and beyond and doing truly incredible work and making very real sacrifices, not socially distancing themselves from the problem, but actually running to it to help those patients. So let me thank you for your sacrifice. It's such a beautiful day outside right now, and so often uh, we have no control over disasters uh, that befall us, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a tornado, whether it's a flood, whether it's an oil spill. Uh, these things happen to us without a lot of warning, uh, and they just come down at, at an instance. And, and, and we can see them, and we can see the danger, and we can see the peril. Uh, but for the first time, we're actually in the driver's seat of being able to flatten out this curve and take this disaster on head on. So let me be clear to the public. You, 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 you're hearing from some elected officials. You're hearing from some experts in the field. But this is really a group lift. This is about what we all do individually and collectively, whether you are a plumber, a cameraman, a reporter, a student, you are playing as big a role as anybody else in this. The choices that you make, the places you choose to go and not to go, may have a direct impact on the loss of life in the city of New Orleans. Now, as New Orleanians, as Americans, we are not going through this alone. Uh, we're going through it together. As human beings, we're going through this together. And we can only, and we can look at what has occurred in other countries and what they have done to flatten this thing out. And I've said this a number of times. I brought up the comparison from over a century ago from, from Philadelphia and St. Louis, both suffering the exact same influenza epidemic. Now, one of those city leaders chose not to inconvenience All right, right now we're having some technical issues, uh, but you were just hearing from uh, Mayor Latoya Cantrell's administration uh, updating us on the proclamation that she has signed, of course, getting us uh, up to speed, basically saying to us that the city of New Orleans will shut down uh, by, by midnight. So when we mean that, we say bars, gyms, shopping centers like the Riverwalk and Canal Place, uh, live performance venues, they shall cease operations. Restaurants, as you already know, or we've tried to inform you here on WWL, they will be limited to operations of takeout and delivery only. 
We've also seen bars that were shut down at midnight as well. They're also talking to many different data uh, companies such as uh, Cox Cable on removing removing data limits for Wi Fi. We know that they have a lot of students who are home right now who need access to Wi Fi Internet. We also have college students as well who are home right now um, doing uh, that virtual online classrooms uh, as we've it's been as it's been mentioned. So let's go right back out. I know that we had some technical issues, but let's go back out uh, to that news conference still being held by Mayor Latoya Cantrell. And in the meantime, we're also uh, we hoping to hear that. from uh, Governor Edwards in just a couple of minutes. So right now, let's take a good listen Figure in. Figure out what your role will be in this pandemic. You can help flatten it out or you can make it worse. Say one other thing. Uh, compassion, commerce and community. I brought that up yesterday. A lot of small businesses are going to suffer. A lot of restaurants are going to suffer through this. So if you typically went out and you typically went to restaurants, I encourage you to buy gift certificates now to get these businesses through this tough time. And we get through it, you can come in and cash those things in just to help these businesses stay open. If you're going to order food and pick it up, tip heavier than you ever have before to help these folks get through this. This is going to be about us taking care of us. And we can't do it the way we normally did. If this was a, a hurricane uh, or, or, or a tornado, then I, I, I could grab the mayor, I could hug her, I could say we're gonna get through this. That's not happening these days. This social distance is what's gonna get us through this. So just know that we will get through it. It is not going to be easy. It is not going to be quick, but we will get through it. We absolutely will, and thank you so much. You're inappropriate at this time, and we will continue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll get to your question, but there's a process and there's a procedure. And if we do things in decency and in order, we'll absolutely serve you at the best level and the best quality that you deserve because you do. Make no mistake about that. But right now, we're going to continue on with the press conference uh, and hearing from updates from our city council uh, leaders. So at this time, I want to ask uh, Councilman Jeruso if he would come forward. Is he here? OK. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I want to thank you for all the resources that you are marshalling here to deal with all of this. Um, obviously, we've been dealing with this as city leaders for the last several days, but yesterday I learned that my law school classmate, Mark Frelo, is one of the people who has COVID-19. And that drives home the point to me that this is not a disease of people who are simply old or infirm or have pre-existing conditions. He is only two years older than I am, and that, in my view, makes him still a relatively young man. And so I would echo Dr. Avegno's point that all we can do is be good to each other by keeping distance from each other. And that is something particularly in District A where we have a number of universities that they are starting to implement and asking the students, and I know they've asked the mayor to be a, a big partner of theirs, to make sure that happens. As we know, this is a part of our culture. We hug and we kiss, but for now, I think the most important thing is to make sure that we're keeping that safe distance from one another. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. And we'll keep it going. I know Councilman Banks is joining us as well. Councilman? Thank you, Madam Mayor. You know, this is unprecedented. We have not seen anything like this in our lifetime. There is no script. We're writing this as we go, based on the circumstances that we have to deal with. The fact of the matter is none of these things are being done arbitrarily. They are not being done because we want to hurt, punish, or reward anybody. They're being done because this is what public safety requires. Now, I've heard much noise about doing this without telling people, well, if we had known we were going to have to do it, we would have told you. But the fact is nobody knew we were going to be dealing with the coronavirus. This is being done as we are in it. So forgive us for not having pre-knowledge and telling you what's about to happen. Now, I've seen much noise, heard much noise, and seen much stupidity that says that this virus doesn't affect certain segments of the community. That is a blatant lie. 
This virus does not care whether you are black or white, rich or poor, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, gay, straight, uptown, downtown, literate or illiterate. It does not matter. The fact is all of us are subject to being hit by this virus unless we take the necessary precautions. Please do not use the noise on Facebook as your reference for how to deal with this. Now, I know that it really sounds important that somebody puts on there, my cousin, brother, boyfriend, sister, uncle work at the Pentagon and he heard that they were gonna do X. Well, the fact is, unless you get X from a reputable source, the Centers of Disease Control from the city of New Orleans or one of the legitimate websites, please do not use that for your information. You are jeopardizing your life. Now, we have banned the size of groups for a reason. The only way that we can mitigate this is to flatten the curve. Now, let's be real, y'all. We cannot legislate stupidity. If you are stupid enough to go out there and group up, that's really unfortunate, but the reality of it is that is going to have dire consequences either for you or for people that you care about. Make no mistake, this is not a joke. Nobody here is playing. This is as real as rain. I want to again thank the culture bearers who stood down on Sunday. But I want to ask them again to please not do anything on St. Joseph's Day. You will have the opportunity to show your pretty at some other time. We know that you work countless hours on putting those suits together. We know that they are absolutely magnificently beautiful. But the reality of it is now is not the time to show them. Matter of fact, that's what you can use Facebook for. On that one, it's a good use. We have to be intentional about what we're doing and make no mistake about this. We will do all that we can do to try to help you get through this. But you got to help us too. Please heed the warnings. If you are sick, stay home. If you cannot function, call your doctor. Don't call 911 and clog the 911 system. Be intentional about your safety and the people around you. If you've got elderly neighbors, check on them. If you've got elderly relatives, or elderly relatives check on them. But the fact of the matter is we have to join together to get through this. And I have no doubt, this is the most resilient community on the planet. We are going to get through this, but it's going to be intentional as long as we are working together. That is the key to this. Do what you got to do and make sure the people around you are safe. Thank, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, so much, Councilman. And to his points, absolutely we're going to get through this. You know, we've, we've said it and you've heard it many a times, not only by words, but by action, how resilient our community is and our people. But one of the greatest challenges as we've gotten through th things over the past, it's been through that human touch and that love and, and that hugging, which we know that that creates just a different challenge for us as being New Orleanians. And I heard this the loudest and with the best level of compassion and passion possible. And that's from neighborhood leadership. Right there on the ground. And I got my first call last night from a community leader, and I told her, I've been, I've been waiting for you, because after Katrina, that was really me. And so it's always time to engage and involve neighborhood leaders at every level. It's always a good time. But the time is truly determined by when it comes up off the ground. And so with that, we have included our neighborhood leaders that also are includes our faith-based leadership as well. But I'm going to ask um, Morgan Clevenger to come up and we will also, she will be followed by other leaders who would like to share uh, their viewpoints with the community. But we can talk to you all day long, meaning elected officials and partners. But when you hear it from your community leadership, I think it sets a different tone so with that, I didn't have that opportunity being that neighborhood leader post Katrina with government standing side by side. But it's a new day in the city of New Orleans. And Ms. Morgan, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and, you know, first I want to say thanks for taking that call because 
I don't call you often, but this is the time. And first, I just want to say, you can save a life. You can. Every one of us here, every one of us in every neighborhood, in every community. Um, our particular neighborhood in the Seventh Ward, we have a lot of seniors. We're very, very concerned about them. But we're also concerned about the generations of family that live with them and the younger people that are out and about and moving around and feeling very, you know, like this is not going to affect them. But if you care about your family, your extended family, your neighbors, and your community and your city, we have to do this. We have to adhere to the recommendations from our government, from our health care uh, section, from our scientists, because if we don't, we're going to lose our city. And we can all say, oh, well, we've been through it before, but this is different. And as we've all heard and said over and over again, we want to manage adversity by loving each other, by coming out and gathering, by hugging, by kissing, and, and showing our love and support for each other. We can still do that. We just have to find a different way. And this is an opportunity for the most creative, resilient city in the world to use this time to find new ways to connect, to support, and to lift each other up and keep us all going. And it's just going to have to have a different way of doing it. Um, I also want to encourage everybody to understand that we know there's a lot of hurt out there already. We know there's a lot of hurt coming. And for the least of us who have the least, we need to count on, which I am right now, supporting and counting on our administration, our governor, to bring the resources to our city that we need. And whether that's uh, hand sanitizer and toilet paper, or meals, or field hospitals from the National Guard, we need to support our administration, put all of our differences aside, be kind to one another, and make sure we lift each other up. You can save a life. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Morgan. And we have a couple more leaders that would like to speak at this time. I'm going to ask Bishop Love. Bishop, you're here. You want to come on up? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. On behalf of the uh, churches, synagogues, temples, um, we want the mayor to know that we're standing in agreement with you when it comes to us coming together uh, to make sure that we can do what we need to do physically, but also what we need to do spiritually. Um, if we're going to get through this, it's going to be through us working together, also being at personal peace. Uh, it's a it's a sila moment, a time to a time to rest and reflect and trust uh, that our leaders are going to get us everything that we need uh, in the time that we need it. So it's going to be very important uh, while we're doing social distancing uh, that we also stay in some type of contact with each other. Uh, pastors, we can now go online. Uh, we can have church on Facebook, we can have church on the phone, we can have church with our families, uh, because if you can't preach uh, to a little crowd, you can't preach to a big crowd. Um, so we want to make sure that the mayor understands that the spiritual community is also standing in agreement with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Reverend Calhoun? We do say good evening to everyone. We cannot overemphasize, and first let me thank the mayor and her team and our councilmatic people that have really brought us to the point that we can move forward as a community. What I would like for the community to realize and to understand is that as a community, our councilman told us, it's heavy lifting time. It's time for community to come together, look over what resources that may be available in the community already and start talking about how we can utilize what we, ha what we need and how we utilize what we have. We are looking to that point right now to talk about bringing the community together, having those co phone conversations that identify what is actually needed in our community, what we have, and what we need to do. We want to thank everybody for coming together and working together to make this get us through this environment that we're in now. It Thank takes you. Us all. Gentilly, you gonna step up? Okay. All, right. All, right. all right. I just want to first of all say thank you to Mayor Cantrell 
and her team uh, for the great leadership uh, that she's providing during this time. Um, I just want to specifically talk to the residents of Pontchartrain Park. Uh, we have many elderly in our neighborhood. Um, it's very important that those that can to reach out to them, they may need groceries to be picked up or something of uh, a nature that they can't get out. And so I would like to look out for our uh, elderly in the community. In addition, the Pontchartrain Park Senior Center is closed until uh, further notice and we will not be having our neighborhood association meetings until further notice. Um, we just got to stay diligent, listen to the instructions that's provided by our medical advisors and by our city, city, uh, city leaders um, and just uh, listen, pay attention because all of us are in this together and um, we all are, this is our first time fighting this battle. So just listen and follow the instructions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we appreciate our neighborhood leaders who are with us. We have so many that everyone cannot speak, but we will continue to engage them. Our next community call of neighborhood leaders is Wednesday coming. Uh, and so with that, uh, we will go to questions. Uh, no, I'm gonna have my chief come on up. Uh, we will make sure one that law enforcement is uh, necessary, and we will take action as needed. Uh, and I will uh, allow right now for our chief of police to speak to this matter, as we have had various conversations about it today. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. As she said, no uh, law and order is what this is about. Uh, us working together. Uh, we have been in constant communication uh, with the court systems, uh, with our partners at the sheriff's office, uh, the district attorney's office, as well as the public defender's office. I did, in fact, receive that letter. But our position is we will treat everything on a case-by-case -case basis, but we must maintain law and order in order for us to survive or get through this COVID-19 issue together. So uh, we will be looking at things that we could do and continue to do differently. We, as a department, leads our state, if not the country, in our process, in our policies of jail depopulation by summoning as much as possible, by citing as much as possible instead of arresting. So uh, we will treat each case on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. And urging all, all community you know, leaders, all even assembled here and throughout the community to be the eyes and ears that are necessary to protect to protect all of us. But uh, at the end of the day, law and order is a top priority in the city of New Orleans. Ms. LaTanya? Well, a couple of those is one, uh, we are working with business owners as it relates to paid time off. Um, as it relates to city employees, for example, we have civil leave, but it is it comes into effect when you have had symptoms of, of the virus. Um, having children, we understand that. You know, we all have children and, and working with our social networks and family members to help us with child care. One of the things that we have done as a city is to ensure that all of our early learning facilities continue, that we're funding, continue to receive that level of funding and also they're working creatively to try to meet the needs of our families, but it is insufficient at this time, meaning we do not have a source for child care universal throughout the city of New Orleans, state of Louisiana. That is, that is, that's the fact. And so while we understand that there's a burden that comes with our children being out of school, this is also a time when we're talking about community creating that safety net and being uh, unified and showing that spirit of compassion, this is another way for us to think creatively in terms of how we can meet the needs of our families. Right, and when we're talking about loitering in terms of businesses, we're not in any way talking about our 
homeless population and those who are street homeless. There are active, um, not only uh, temperature checks that are happening, but even as it relates to the sweeps, understanding our most vulnerable populations of people in which they are. And so as it relates to that, we'll you know, stay uh, very focused on this population and working with all of our housing partners to find them a place to reside. This also comes to, when I talk about surge capacity, this population is built in uh, to that resource as well. When we're looking at ways and other facilities that could be used uh, to house people, and that includes our homeless population as well. They're not excluded from any of our planning, any of our resources. They are part of and at the table in every thought and every decision that is being made, and they will continue to be there. Even as it relates to my asks to the governor, also my asks to the federal government. WWL and Fox 8. Uh, this is for Colin. Um, in relation to the federal pilot program. Mm -hmm. um, and did you say it's HHS that's going to be doing this? It's D Come on, Colin. It is primarily run by Health and Human Services and FEMA. Okay. Right now is who we're dealing with at the federal level, state of Louisiana. Federally supported, state managed, locally ran. That's kind of how we do these things. Um, it's still a lot to work out. And um, as soon as I know more and have a, a better hold on, on the federal side of it, We'll lay it all out. And to that point, though, I know it's not a lot of details yet, but in Dallas, they, I think they're starting it at Parkland Hospital. Uh, will these be testing centers at hospitals or other places around the city? Can you say yet? Can't determine yet. Yeah. And then just the last part of that question. Um, and, and I don't know if that's the same program. It's not. It's not? Okay. No, it's okay. not. Um, the last part of this question, it's a pilot program, but how is it different from other drive-through testing that's going on across because the Because it's country? being directly supported by the federal government, by, by Health and Human Services, down to the state level for coordination and then down to the local level with state assistance to actually push it out. What you're seeing with drive throughs right now is in the medical community, the universities and hospitals doing it, which it, which is totally encouraged. Yes. This is the federal government making a foray into it and attempting to, to do something, and, and we were selected to be part of that, and we're going to continue to work it. Thank you, Colin. Right, so right now, um, there are a couple of things. One, the city is working with our partners through the New Orleans Business Alliance, as well as with our Office of Economic Development to stand up resources that at our disposal, looking at ways in which we can deploy CDBG dollars and also continuing to advocate for additional dollars from the federal level. Uh, the NOLA BA, along with our partners there, are standing up, as Colin uh, referred to, as a gig fund for uh, those cultural bears who will be tremendously impacted uh, by venues closing, wanting to scale that up for small businesses as well. We have been working in collaboration with the state and federal partners relative to the Small Business Associ you know, Administration. Uh, that's to activate uh, loans that could be deployed for small businesses that qualify. We have also been very aggressive uh, as it relates to business interruption uh, support and services and insurance. Uh, we understand that pandemics oftentimes are not included in their insurance coverage, which makes this a priority for our administration to push for these resources at the state and federal level. Of course, we are pushing our people to unemployment insurance, uh, as um, Councilmember Moreno reported on. Uh, the relaxation of that timeline from 21 days has been decreased to 14 days. However, we're not satisfied with that. So we're going to continue uh, to push really for zero, you know, but minimize even coming down from 14 even to seven. But that also speaks to the outcry that we're making uh, to our larger business community for supportive services to stand up a fund for gap resources or gap financing to our families who will find themselves in this situation. 
Also, there are a number of businesses that are doing it on their own relative to um, paid time off. Harris, for example, is moving forward with extending pay to their employees in an upward of two weeks. In addition to that, making sure that their wellness center is activated and available for their employees. Uh, we have many different businesses that are standing up, being the leaders that they are in our community, and really paving the way uh, to where other businesses may be able to model the things that they're doing to provide those safeguards to employees. But we do anticipate an upward of 45,000 uh, service uh, employees that, that stand to be impacted. But make no mistake, we're all impacted. We're all impacted. And that includes government, that includes our churches, that includes our businesses. We are all impacted and we're all going to be inconvenienced because of it, but it will not in any way deter us from utilizing our resources effectively so that we can work to meet the needs of our people, again, meeting them where they are. Well, it absolutely could, and that's why the priorities for any drive-through or additional testings that we're able to deploy, the top priority will be and is our first responders, which includes our medical professionals, because if we don't take care of the people that we depend on to take care of us, we are really, uh, we're bound to be in, in trouble. Uh, with the CDC guidelines, uh, doctor, you wanna speak to that? And, and let me just, you know, Targeting, first of all, with this pilot, we we don't know we are we are, don't know exactly what the priorities are going to be set. However, we do know that healthcare workers are always a priority, and getting healthcare workers tested means that we know who can go back to work quicker, right? So some of them will be positive, then we'll be able to start the clock, right? Um, if they're not getting tested, we have to assume the worst and they stay home for a much longer time. Uh, in, in terms of the, the mm -hmm. CDC guidelines, again, this is for substantial community transmission, which we believe that we have, and really very clear about canceling gatherings of any size, gatherings. Again, you've probably heard a lot of numbers about 50 or 250. We really wanna be proactive and go a step further and say, using your personal responsibility, if you believe that your business can operate in a space where you can ensure good cleaning uh, procedures, proper and aggressive social distancing, and avoiding groups that are more than small, right, than, than you would think would be a, a, a household size, then your business can conduct that business. If you can work from home, you work from home. That's gonna be the case at every business around the city. Including City Hall. Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Come on. <clears throat> Whenever we do this, the drive-through testing, we're not going to test people that don't have symptoms. That's a fact. Let's be clear, okay? And I'm sorry, Doc, I'm gonna, I'm, <laughs> let's be clear. If you don't have the symptoms, be thankful. If you don't have the symptoms of this, a test doesn't mean anything. It will be negative. But two days later, you could come across the person who's five cars behind you waiting in line for this test who was sick and didn't get tested. So I, I just want to say, I ask for the public's help when we do this. We've seen it in, in hurricanes and in the past with some of the, you know, when we do pods and for MREs and water and, and people are suffering and we get it, but please, whatever how we set this up and it's still there's a lot to be determined please listen to the instructions that we give you because we need to get this to the people that are actually right now we're watching a news conference uh, with mayor latoya cantrell and her I and updating us on changes that were made throughout the city of new orleans right now we switch on over to governor edwards giving us an update from the state capitol from our day the lake here in baton rouge and, and uh, both of these individuals will speak to you shortly Obviously, this is a rapidly evolving and escalating crisis. 
Um, and I know that you've heard now from the president, the vice president, and, and others multiple times over the last 24 hours. Um, clearly, this situation is escalating and growing more serious, and it deserves a bigger response. And that's what we are doing in Louisiana. But I just want to start by reassuring the people of our state that, as we always have, we're going to get through this. And we're going to do it by being good neighbors to one another. Uh, we're going to do it by working together, by cooperating with one another, and certainly we're going to do it by following the directives being given by the federal, the state, and by local government. And I am certainly reminded uh, that in tough times like this, um, it is always appropriate to remember and to lean on the fact that we are a faithful people. And I am certainly reminded of Isaiah 41.10, fear not. For I am with you, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with, a righteous, with my righteous hand. So having said that, I want to get into the briefing now, um, and that is the most essentially, we have significantly ramped up our efforts to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And I want to describe this again for everybody. We have to flatten the curve so that the peak of transmissions is not as high as it would otherwise be and that the duration of the event is extended out longer than would otherwise be the case. And we do this to protect the public because we cannot run the risk of overwhelming our capacity to meet the demand for medical services, critical medical services. Uh, that's what you're seeing in some places around the world um, who didn't take uh, aggressive mitigation measures early enough. And so we are doing what we can uh, to get on the front side of that. Uh, you should know that earlier today I met with Senator Bill Cassidy. I thank him for coming by and visiting with me. You should also know that I spent about an hour and a half on a telephone call with the president and the vice president, members of the cabinet, um, and with uh, practically every governor in the state of Louisiana. Following that, I also held a call with mayors and other leaders from around the state of Louisiana. Suffice it to say, we are all in agreement that mitigation measures need to be stepped up significantly and immediately here and around the country. I will remind you that this time last week, we had just announced our first positive case of COVID-19. As of this briefing, we now have 136 cases, 22 new cases since our morning update. One of those new cases in a, is in Ascension Parish, the first in the capital region of the state. And sadly, just moments ago, we had our third death an 84-year-old from Lambeth House in Orleans Parish. And yes, it is still true that the majority of cases are in New Orleans. The number there is currently at 94, 12 cases at the Lambeth House. But to be clear, we have positive cases now across the state. And no one should have a false sense of security when they look at the list of parishes and see which ones have and do not have positive cases. And that is because I suspect, and we have been told, that as we more aggressively test around the state of Louisiana, we will confirm more cases of COVID-19. Further, the cases that are being tested positive today, those exposures likely happened four, five, six, seven days ago. So even if we are 100% effective in our mitigation efforts today, we are still going to see a rise in cases uh, going into the future. But the fact of the matter is the best we can hope for from our mitigation measures is a slowdown of the transmissions, not that we will be able to stop all transmissions. So if your community has not yet been named, it doesn't mean that the virus isn't present, and it certainly doesn't mean that no one has been tested. It is likely a matter of time before there is a case in your area. And I want everyone to understand that so that when it happens, you are not surprised. 
Um, the Louisiana Department of Health has confirmed substantial community spread in Louisiana. And it is also true that on a per capita basis, we have one of the highest rates of COVID-19 spread positive cases in the country. And what concerns me is the healthcare delivery system is sized to meet the needs of a given population. And so having one of the highest per capita number of cases of COVID in the country means that we are uh, at risk for exceeding the ability that we have to deliver health care if we don't slow the transmission and extend the duration of this event. So I cannot stress enough that this is a very serious situation that demands an equally serious response and a prompt response. And that is why we have implemented important statewide measures. When we look at what has worked in stopping the spread of COVID-19 in other countries, it is protective actions that create social distance because we know the virus spreads easily and swiftly. And in addition to the distance that you have to keep from other individuals, you also have to be mindful that the virus can live on surfaces for some period of time that can extend out several days. So what are we going to do? Tonight, beginning at midnight, we're going to further limit the size of gatherings to fewer than 50 people. We're closing casinos, bars, movie theaters, gyms, and fitness centers, and we're going to limit restaurants to takeout, delivery, and drive through orders only. And we thank the Restaurant Association in advance for doing the work that they have done and will continue to do uh, with our restaurants. These changes are statewide. At this time, the plan is for operations to resume on April the 13th. However, we will reevaluate the situation a week before or in the weeks before that to determine whether these need to be extended. And certainly at all times, we will be looking for additional mitigation measures that might have to be implemented. We are requesting Small Business Administration assistance for businesses that will be impacted adversely by our response to COVID-19. And yes, we are well aware that the CDC has just advised that high-risk individuals should not be in gatherings of more than 10 people. And I cannot stress this enough. The most vulnerable part of our population are these high-risk individuals. And it starts at about age 65 for the elderly. And of course, the, the more vulnerable they are depends upon how much older they are. But also those individuals with underlying chronic health conditions that may have compromised their immune system, they may have diabetes, heart disease, something, uh, a respiratory ailment, things like that. And you're going to get more information uh, in just a little bit on, on these uh, matters. And we also know that the CDC guidance is to run these countermeasures for eight weeks. And therefore, I'm putting the state on notice now that it is much more likely than not that these measures will be continued for an additional 13 days beyond the current expiration date. In addition to closures and modifications, because what I just said is directed at certain establishments. I want to talk to individuals right now, everybody out there, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're vulnerable, whether you are not. You should avoid eating or drinking in bars, restaurants, and food courts. Instead, use drive-through, pickup, or delivery options. Cook at home. Go buy your groceries. In New Orleans, as they say, go make your groceries. Uh, cook at home. Avoid discretionary travel, shopping trips, and social visits. Do not visit nursing homes or retirement or long-term care facilities unless you're there to provide critical assistance. And in fact, we know that visitation at nursing homes, hospitals, prisons, and jails has been curtailed in all but emergency matters. Practice good hygiene. Wash your hands, especially after touching any frequently used item or surface. 
Avoid touching your face. Sneeze or, sneeze or cough into a tissue or the inside of your elbow. Disinfect frequently used items and surfaces as much as possible. I have authorized the mobilization of 400 Louisiana National Guardsmen, of which 150 have already been activated, uh, to provide security at Bayou Signet State Park, which has opened. Uh, and to help ensure that things run smoothly at the three drive-through testing sites that we hope and believe and are working extremely hard to have come online later this week. And more about those testing sites in just a moment. We are asking those with underlying health conditions and those age 60 or older to limit their social interactions. Um, as I mentioned, those health conditions include heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, and those whose immune systems are compromised. Um, such as those undergoing cancer treatments. Those who fall into one or more of these categories are the most at risk. As for our younger people and those who are not especially vulnerable, you should be practicing social distancing as well. And the fact is that you could be carrying the virus and transmit it to someone who doesn't have a strong immune system and they could become infected and very sick. When it comes to shopping for basic supplies, you should know that America has the most efficient supply chain system in the world and that it is working. We've been assured in the call with the vice president and the president that the grocery stores are going to stay open, pharmacies are going to stay open, but we are asking everyone here in Louisiana and around the country when you go to the store, buy for the week. Don't try to buy for the month or longer. If you keep your normal, usual shopping habits, there will not be a problem. You do not need to hoard items or stock, stock up for extended periods of time. Store hours may change, given the need to clean and restock shelves more frequently. We're asking people to be a good neighbor. Call your elderly family. Call your elderly friends. Call your neighbors with chronic illnesses. Check on them. As I mentioned earlier, to help increase our testing capacity, we expect that later this week in New Orleans, two drive-through sites will be established and one site for drive-through testing will be established in Jefferson Parish. Individuals will be screened, and these sites are open, and please understand this. Uh, this these are sites that are being set up in conjunction with the federal government. Uh, in preference in Louisiana, we were one of just a handful of states selected. Again, this reflects on the fact that we have one of the highest per capita numbers of cases of COVID-19 in the country, but we were picked by the national government to have uh, these sites. And per their protocols, individuals will be screened, and these sites are going to be open for health care workers, first responders, individuals older than 65 or older, and those who are chronically ill, all of whom have to be symptomatic. So those are the individuals who will be tested at those three sites, two in New Orleans, one in Jefferson Parish. Here in East Baton Rouge Parish, the Baton Rouge General Hospital Mid-City location uh, was open today as a drive-through testing site. This site, however, is open only for ambulatory individuals who have a doctor's order for the test. The general public should not be going to Baton Rouge General Mid-City in order to try to get a test. Instead, any individual with signs or symptoms of the flu or coronavirus must call their medical provider for referral to that community testing center. Only patients with a provider order faxed to the testing center will be administered a COVID-19 test. Upon arrival, patients will show their provider order, state issued ID, insurance card, and remain in their vehicle while pro professional healthcare, while healthcare professionals, I should say, administer the test. If you are bringing a child for testing, the guardian's name must match the name on the provider order. All individuals around the state, if you do not have a primary care physician and you 
looking for help because you're symptomatic uh, and you want a test, you should call 211 for support in connecting you to a health care provider. That is 211 for those calls. I know that's a lot of information. I also know that these closures are aggressive and they create a burden on businesses. At a bare minimum, they inconvenience hundreds of thousands of people across our state. I know there are areas of the state that don't yet have confirmed cases of coronavirus. Understand the experts tell us the coronavirus is currently spread across the state of Louisiana and we fully expect this to be confirmed by testing in the coming days. And I also know that social distancing goes against the fiber of our beings as Louisianans who love to have parties, crawfish boils, and just look for any excuse to get together and enjoy fellowship with one another. But we are taking these measures on behalf of all of our people, young and old, healthy and sick. I've often said that our ability to work together as Louisianans when times are tough is our best quality. And there's no higher priority for any government or any governor than the health and safety of its people, period. And that is why we are doing what we are doing. And we're doing it in full coordination with our federal partners and the health care community. And I'm just going to level with you. Our mitigation measures, no matter how pronounced, no matter how significant they are, they are not going to have their intended effect unless the people of Louisiana abide by them. My executive order will do nothing to slow the spread of coronavirus if the people of Louisiana don't do their part. And I am imploring everyone to take this seriously, be a good citizen, be a good neighbor. And I have every confidence that you will be. As you know, our K through 12 schools are closed currently. I'm asking to be patient with schools that are working hard to put non-congregate feeding plans in place. That is happening across the state now. We have more than 20 school districts with feeding sites. These are non-congregate, so these are drive-through feeding sites uh, for these students. School administrators are also working very hard to put lesson plans in place for students and to communicate those lessons plans with parents. Louisiana Public Broadcasting is changing its programming to provide as much educational program as possible approved by the Department of Education for all ages from K through 12. And so I ask all parents, all students, all teachers to engage in that process as well. Again, for this to work, we all must do our part. And it is critically important that people stay home when they are sick. Now that we have identified community spread, even if we're not sick, we all have to find ways to stay in your homes more often. You're going to be doing social distancing right once you're planning your week and your routines around COVID-19 and fully embracing the mitigation measures that I have announced and any more that might be announced later. And I'm not just talking about New Orleans or Jefferson Parish or St. Tammany or these other parishes where we've identified positive cases. What we're learning is that it can take two weeks for symptoms to appear and longer than that for infected individuals to test positive. We believe we are still unearthing community spread that's been around for the past couple of weeks. So make no mistake about it. This is a statewide problem. It demands a statewide solution. My administration from our frontline health workers to COVID-19 task force that I established earlier this month is and will continue to take aggressive, aggressive measures to contain this virus. But we all have a role to play in protecting not just ourselves, but our fellow Louisianans. 
If this message sounds a bit extreme, it's because the situation demands that it must be. Again, we are tough. We are resilient. We will get past this, but only because we're going to take it seriously now and do what we've been called upon to do. So, again, I would call upon our faithful people here in Louisiana uh, to, to not only take the actions that I have just laid out for you, but also to engage in prayer, as I always call upon us to do in times of disaster and crisis. Um, I'm going to be followed now by Dr. Alex Biu, who will provide an update, and then by Dr. Catherine O'Neill uh, from Our Lady of the Lake, who will share a slightly different perspective with you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so as the governor noted, um, we are seeing increased levels of testing around the state, uh, and as we expect, we'll also see increased numbers of cases. Uh, our most up-to-date case number currently is 136, uh, and the state lab continues to um, operate around the clock, especially for the populations that we need to get an answer uh, to their COVID status as quickly as possible. Uh, importantly, we're also seeing access to commercial lab testing increase throughout the state as well. Um, and as the governor noted, th that's going to be critical for expanding our ability to test and identify COVID in communities around the state, uh, uh, identify individuals who should be isolated to slow the spread in their communities, um, and ideally um, uh, slow the spread and, and move uh, the, the, the flatten the curve and, and, and uh, extend the duration of this uh, uh, current epidemic. Um, so we're working hard uh, in every uh, region around the state uh, with local hospitals and healthcare providers um, uh, to make sure that they have processes uh, in place to get their tests to us uh, and to uh, grow the number of testing sites around the state. We'll continue to work on that. Right, so with that, I'll uh, turn it over. All of us will be affected by this pandemic. All of us in every community will feel the effects of the pandemic. Most of us will become infected over the next many months. 80% of us will not feel the effects of these infections. 80% of us will be asymptomatic, and will feel well, and will continue to go about our daily lives. We'll go to the grocery store, we'll play with our kids, many of us will go to work. But as the governor said earlier, even asymptomatic people with COVID can spread the infection. That spread is what we're worried about. The most vulnerable part of our population for this infection are the elderly and people with comorbid conditions. The elderly are our grandparents and our great grandparents. People with comorbid conditions are our peers and our coworkers, the people who teach our children. They're our family members. What does it mean to have a comorbid condition a comorbid condition is a condition in which another condition is present. It's a very bizarre term. Basically, it means you have two medical conditions. Think about the people in your lives who have two medical conditions, who have two bottles of medicine that they take every day. Those people are the people that surround us, and they are at risk of being in the hospital, having severe morbidity, meaning being in a long time in the hospital, and then sometimes, and in this disease often, having a fear of death. We will see people hospitalized at great rates with this infection in this state, and we will see people die. If we continue to allow people who are asymptomatic come into contact with people who are vulnerable to this infection, we will see that rate increase in a way that our healthcare community is not capable of taking care of these patients. If we overwhelm our hospitals now, we will not have enough doctors, nurses, and support staff to take care of patients. We will not be able to offer the best care to your loved ones. We will not have all the medications and the proper equipment needed to treat them. If we flatten that curve by staying in touch with our family members and in touch with our peers and our coworkers, but staying a social distance away from them and only coming into contact in small groups, we will flatten that curve. <clears throat> Many people will still become ill, but we will be able to care for them. We will not overwhelm the health care system, and we will allow everyone to receive the care that we expect. How do you do that? How do you help us flatten the curve? You have to put COVID-19 on your calendar. You have to think about your week 
and think about every gathering in terms of how many people are here. Are we washing hands? Are we wiping shared surfaces? Are we staying a great distance from each other? Could we have done this remotely? If we don't do this, we will not be protecting our friends, our families, and we will lose loved ones. Today, think about the people around you. They are people with comorbid conditions, and they need our help. And our healthcare workers need your help so that every day when we come to our jobs and we come to take care of our patients, we know that we can give the best care. And that is only possible if we slow down this curve of infection, if we allow it to occur over a long period of time, and we let the system take care of each patient the way we want them to be taken care of. I come from a very small town full of Cajuns, and we love to hug each other, and we love to feed each other, and we are going to have to do that in very small groups, one person at a time, washing our hands each time. And from now on, we're gonna have to give some sort of elbow bump, and I would prefer it to be in the air. But if we do that, we'll be here next year, gathering again, having crawfish boils, and going about life. And that's, that's what we ask of everybody. That's what we ask of our healthcare community, and that's what we ask for the citizens of Louisiana. Give us an opportunity to help you by taking care of you in small doses over the next several months and allowing you to receive the best care. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you, Dr. Bean. <coughs> At this point, it's a good reminder. Um, and I will take your questions. Sam. Governor, uh, we've seen sort of a dizzying array of escalating restrictions, right? Starting with 250 people, ban yeah. now 50 people, now bars and restaurants. Can you just explain to us why exactly, in just a matter of days, we what is it you guys are seeing in terms of the numbers? Is it just worse than we thought? Is, is well, well, first of all, um, it is obviously worse today than it was last week. Um, but we, at the state level, are heavily dependent upon and relying upon the Centers for Disease Control. And, and we know that they have more expertise, that they are modeling this, and as their guidance changes, my actions change. And so the things you've seen uh, me put in place have been a direct reflection of what the CD is saying, CDC is saying what we need to have in place. Um, and, and the CDC is saying these things about the country as a whole, but we know that we are one of the hotspots uh, across the country. So that's, that's why we are doing this. Um, and if you just simply look at what has happened overseas, and I know sometimes we tend to think, well, we're the United States of America. What happened in Italy is not what we're going to see. There is no basis upon which we can know that with any certainty. And in fact, if we don't want to be Italy in terms of this coronavirus outbreak trend and transmission, then we better do things differently, we better do things better, and we better do things earlier. And those are the mitigation measures that we are talking about. Uh, and so that's why as we learn more about this situation, as more information becomes available, uh, then we are, we are taking action. Um, and, and again, it's, there is nothing associated with this outbreak that, that I wanted to do, obviously. I, it's just all essential. As I mentioned earlier, there is no government and no governor uh, that isn't primarily concerned above everything else with the health and safety and well-being of the people that are governed. That's what we're dealing with here today. Uh, and so that's why you've seen us do what we're doing. Um, and, and I think it's not just the dialogue here, although I, I haven't heard anyone more eloquently state, I think, exactly what we're up against than Dr. O'Neill just did. But, but it's, the, it's the conversation that's happening around the country. Uh, you've seen, I believe, in the last day or so a different um, posture uh, uh, coming from the president and from the vice president. And we're all working together to do what we can for the American public and for the public here in Louisiana. Yes, sir. As um, testing increases across the state, whether it be through drive through or continuing, um, how it has and more cases pop up, do you expect to see the guidelines for who can get tested, who should get tested, to also expand or keeping it where it is right now? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to let Dr. B.U. Uh, address that because he is our, our specialist uh, at the Office of Public Health when it comes to, to testing. Um, I, do, I do want to try to manage expectations because I know that it was 
a few nights ago uh, that there was some communication coming from the federal government about uh, rapidly expanding testing. Uh, we don't yet have it in place. We're working very, very hard to put it in place just as soon as possible. Um, and everyone should know there still are some logistical challenges associated with doing what what has been represented uh, about these drive-through testing sites. Um, but but we do know that as a general matter, over time, the testing capacity, the throughput capacity, will greatly increase. Not so much because of additional testing going on at the state public lab, because we're, we're, we're running those tests three times a day now, but because we're having more private labs, research labs come online, but the commercial labs like LabCorp, for example, we are, we, I think yesterday we started getting results back uh, from LabCorp, uh, some positive results that didn't actually go through our state public lab. That was the first time that had happened. So I think over the coming days, you're going to see much more information, much more testing. And again, I will predict to you, you're going to see positives in, in a greater a number of parishes across the state than we've currently seen them. Dr. B. Yeah, that's right. I mean, our current guidelines right now are that anyone that has symptoms of COVID, so anybody who's got fever and, and cough or shortness of breath should have a test. Uh, depending on where you are and if you're able to walk up to that test or if you need to be in a hospital, where we run that test is different. But the, the guidelines are, are clear from that point. Whether we're testing you for flu as well may change across the year as we move out of flu season and we see more COVID than flu. Um, but, but right now I wouldn't expect significant changes because we want most people to get tested. What I wouldn't expect us to see anytime soon is a change in wanting people without symptoms to be tested. Again, the current tests that we have are not appropriate for those uh, individuals. So I can't predict the future. There may be tests in the future that are uh, appropriate for asymptomatic individuals. And as we learn more about the virus, we may feel uh, that there is a, a reason to test people at that point, but, but right now we would not foresee that. And, and I think what the governor said is worth noting. The entire country now, I think maybe except maybe uh, West Virginia still, has cases. So the entire country is pulling on the same testing material. We're, we're all trying to ramp up our testing to put these methods in place so that we can identify cases, uh, isolate individuals, slow the spread in communities around the country. So that does put um, constraints on our ability to, to get to the number of tests we might want. Um, but we continue to work diligently. We're working with the federal government to understand how we can use different reagents, different uh, 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 samples, different methods that will allow us to keep our tests running, uh, even if some of those um, uh, items that are hard to get at this point um, uh, continue to be out of stock. So, so think about what Dr. B, you just said. If you're not symptomatic, you should not be tested. And I'm going to take it one step forward. If you're not symptomatic, you should not ask to be tested because you will take up time and effort and a test that should be reserved for someone who is symptomatic. But furthermore, if you are not yet symptomatic, your test is going to come back negative. But you actually might have it. You just didn't allow the symptoms to develop. And so you're going to be falsely reassured that you are negative and you present the greatest risk to everybody because you're going to think you don't have it. So this gets into being a good citizen and a good neighbor. It's exactly why I haven't been tested, because I am not symptomatic. And we, we need people to understand that. That's why we have protocols around who should get tested and at these various sites and what's going to be required and the screening that's going to be in place in order to try to ensure that the protocols are followed. Yes, sir. As you, uh, you said earlier, more than 20 school districts have implemented mm -hmm. the drive through feeding sites. Uh, last week you said you expected mm -hmm. all of them. To, do you still expect that every parish, every public school system? Yes, will have it? yes. And, and there's an application that they have to uh, complete and send in uh, in order to participate in this. Uh, oddly enough, there are waivers that, that have had to be uh, granted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to be able to engage in non-congregant feeding. Um, but those waivers are now in place. These feeding sites are coming online in more districts. Uh, I spoke with acting um, uh, the Secretary of uh, Beth, Beth Cino, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, of the Department of Education. Uh, and, and I made sure that she understood that it was our intent, and of course it was her intent all along, to have all school districts offering uh, sites, feeding sites, so that, so that the kids have access to nutrition while they are not in school. 
Yes, sir. Governor, do you think that people are taking this as seriously as they should in terms of those restrictions? Because we saw a large gathering on Bourbon Street over the yeah. weekend, also here in Baton Rouge. Well, I mean, so it, I think I think you answered your own question. Um, there are some people up to now who have not. It is my hope, quite frankly, it is my expectation um, that with the change in the narrative the, that, that's happening here in Louisiana and around the country, with all the additional measures, with the additional cases, uh, with the additional attention that, that this uh, crisis is generating, uh, that more and more Americans and more and more Louisianans will take it seriously. And by take it seriously, I mean do the things that we are asking them to do uh, so that we can slow uh, this spread, flatten the curve. Um, again, the worst case scenario here is that we fail in that and then we overwhelm our ability to deliver health care services. That's what you have seen in certain places around the world. And there is no reason to believe that won't happen right here in Louisiana if we don't do our part to flatten the curve, to slow the spread of this COVID-19 virus. Yes, sir. Governor, um, you just announced the first death at the Lambeth House. We've obviously seen elsewhere in the country nursing homes and retirement homes can be a, a problem with yeah. this because of the, you know, for obvious reasons. Can you talk about, um, is that a particular concern for you guys moving forward? Um, well, the, the answer is yes. So anytime you have any facility um, that shelters, houses, um, people who are in that most vulnerable category, either because they're older or because they have uh, chronic uh, health conditions. And many of these cases, uh, many of these individuals have, or both, they're older and they have more than one uh, health condition. Uh, you have to be especially careful, which is why last week, well ahead of any guidance coming out of Washington, we took it upon ourselves um, to um, prohibit visitation uh, to nursing homes, to hospitals, to prisons and jails, because we don't want uh, this virus introduced into those areas. Obviously, Lambeth House is still, uh, as I understand it, the only known cluster in Louisiana, despite the fact that we have a number of cases, is the only uh, known cluster for coronavirus. Um, and, and that is very, very tragic because it happens to be a facility uh, that houses uh, older individuals and, and people with, with health care, I'm sorry, underlying health conditions, both on one side that is a, uh, an assisted living center, on the other side, which is an independent living. Um, and as far as we know, every infection actually occurred on the independent living side of that facility. Um, but but at one time they were they were sharing their meals in the same area and that sort of stuff. So we have teams of epidemiologists uh, that have been present at Lambeth House since we discovered it as a cluster. Um, and even though I think we've reported 12 cases there, the fact that it hasn't gotten worse thus far, and we are we are evaluating these people very very carefully and testing all of them who become symptomatic. Uh, you know, I've got my fingers crossed that that situation doesn't get worse. And do you have the number of how many people have been tested so far at the Lambeth House? I, I don't have that number, and I, I don't I don't think Dr. Bu does either. But but this is what I can assure you: every individual at the Lambeth House, whether they're a resident or worker who has become symptomatic, has been tested. Yes, sir. As far as offshore workers going out, I know a lot have asked questions about being tested or coming back and forth. Um, what's uh, kind of, if yeah. anything, guidance as Well, far as th there, is, there is no reason for anyone who isn't symptomatic to be tested. And if someone is symptomatic, as Dr. B, you just mentioned, they should contact their health care provider. If they don't have a health care provider, call 211, explain your situation, explain what your symptoms are and so forth, and you will be given... Uh, the proper information uh, about what it is that you should do. Yes, sir. Governor, the White House uh, has issued, obviously, their guidance, which um, they're calling 15 days to slow the spread, yeah. right? Um, and they've also urged people to avoid gatherings of more than 10 people. So there seems to be some discrepancies. We are obviously extending ours for a month, mm -hmm. and we're at 50 people statewide right now, even though I know New Orleans yeah. has gone beyond that. Can you talk about why there are some discrepancies right now? 
Well, as you know, uh, the CDC changed their guidance last night to 50 people uh, with respect to these gatherings. Um, I, I'm not sure that the CDC guidance uh, that came out last night has changed. What we saw is they issued additional guidance that said that those individuals who are older, those individuals with chronic uh, health conditions, the, the more vulnerable people in our population should under no circumstances be in a gathering of 10 or more people. Uh, they should avoid those uh, at, at all costs. Um, and then I know that the president came out and said something, um, and, and so I can't reconcile what the differences are. We're going to be working on that. Um, rest assured that if there is a need for us to change these mitigation measures that we have in place, we will do that. As for the duration, uh, I, and if I wasn't clear uh, in my prepared remarks, I apologize. Uh, we started off with 30 days. And so I changed the mitigation measures, made them more restrictive uh, for that same time period. However, I did acknowledge that the CDC last night said eight weeks. And so I'm putting the people of Louisiana on notice, and I'm happy to do it again now, uh, that in all likelihood, as we approach that 30-day period, the end of it, we will be expending, extending uh, these measures uh, for at least another month. And, and that would put us at the eight weeks. But I'm trying not to create more confusion than is absolutely necessary uh, by changing the deadlines and so forth. Um, but, uh, but I also want to be very, very clear about that as well. Yes, sir. Do you foresee any restrictions on daycares at this point? I know a lot of people yeah. have called this and have been concerned about that. Yeah, well, we, we are not asking daycares to close and, and, uh, it, for, for the most part. And the reason is we have um, a great number of our health care workers in particular who are not going to be able to go to work if they do not have child care. Uh, and so you, you have to measure different things and, and, and what is the best solution for the general public may not be the best solution for a certain segment of the public uh, if we are going to get as we can. And so we are talking specifically to the early learning centers uh, the child care centers, um, and we are asking them um, to do things a little differently, make sure that their, the kids there are washing their hands more often, uh, perhaps using hand sanitizer, that they're kept in smaller groups where, where possible, that they're not allowed to have congregate feeding. Uh, they shouldn't all be on the playground at the same time and that sort of thing. At the same time, uh, and I'm going to do it again right now, we are asking parents with children if you don't need them in daycare, if you have the ability to keep them in home with yourself or with an older sibling who is old enough to responsibly take care of them, do that. Don't send them to an early learning center or to a child care center. Um, and so, so we are trying to be as, as, um, as careful as we can to get the balance right. And we are having constant communications uh, with all of these providers. Um, and the overwhelming majority of which remain open for the reasons that I just indicated. Yes, sir, one more question. We see things changing at, 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 at a rapid pace right now. We think about the legislative session. Do you think lawmakers will have time to actually pass a budget or yeah. will the extension come on? Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, thank you. It's a good question. So I was informed that the speaker and the president have both agreed to, uh, I don't know if they're calling it a suspension or a recess of the legislature till March 31st. The re final. I'm sorry. They both they voted both chambers voted today. Okay, and and March 31st is the date given because that is a date by which they have to receive a late filed bill in order for that bill to be, ever be considered uh, in session. Uh, so uh, I I think that. Uh, they did the right thing. They're taking this very seriously. Um, it is my hope that the legislature will be able to reconvene uh, and consider and pass at least the must-pass legislation, um, not all 1,500 bills uh, or whatever's been filed, uh, but the truth is there's going to be somewhere between a dozen and 15 to 20 bills that we absolutely have to have before July 1st. Uh, July 1st is a new fiscal year, and, and uh, we, we need to work to, to get that done. 
and we will be working uh, in particular with the speaker and the president in order to see whether we can do that and do it in a way that have as few legislators meeting um, at one time as possible uh, working through their committee structure and so forth and we have to figure out how we provide alternative ways for the public uh, to provide input and so forth but but we we have to get this done and it's another one of those challenges um, and and we're going to work uh, hand in hand with the legislative leadership and rank and file members to try to get it done because it's essential for our state um, and, and I guess it's more imperative than ever than ever if come July 1st we're not past this event and I think you were just told uh, we're not going to be past this event we may be past the initial um, uh, worst part of it but we're not going to be past coronavirus come July 1st that would be the worst possible time to not have the state agencies all of them not just the Department of Health but all of our state agencies up uh, and working uh, so we're going to work with them to, to make sure that we find a way to get the people's business done uh, it's just important look I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you uh, with that thank you again for being here and I just wanted to tell the Louisiana people again I really appreciate uh, the resiliency of our people we are at our absolute best when we work together in times of adversity and I know that this particular disaster this this pandemic which is different for us we've we've been through a lot uh, in terms of floods and and uh, hurricanes and levee breaks and so forth this is different uh, but the need for us to come together be good citizens be good neighbors uh, to be patient to do what local state and federal officials are asking of us uh, it is more paramount now than at any time that I can remember and so I know that's what we're going to get out of the people of Louisiana and whether yesterday you knew how serious this was or whether this morning uh, you knew how serious this was you know now and I'm asking you to do your dead level best to help us make through this and we will and when we come out we're going to be stronger we will have learned lessons from this uh, and and we're going to be better uh, our best days are ahead of us but we all need all of us at this time God bless you and thank you so much all right, for the past two hours, uh, we have been giving you flight. continuous coverage uh, from the state, the local, uh, and uh, the national level here. Um, we had just heard from uh, Governor Edwards. Uh, we heard earlier from Mayor Latoya Cantrell, and before that previously from President Donald Trump. Just want to give you a rundown of what all of the uh, all of these leaders had to say. First, um, one of the biggest updates that we're getting here, just coming from Governor Edwards, announcing that there has been a third death here in Orleans Parish uh, at the Lambeth House, where there are are right now 12 cases at the Lambeth House of coronavirus. So a third death has been announced. That is the very latest when it comes bringing bringing uh, also a new case uh, in this uh, 22 new cases since we have the morning update. He says statewide that we have 136 new cases of coronavirus across the state. 22 new cases again since that morning update, but we have a large amount of cases here in New Orleans. He did confirm that majority of those cases are in Orleans Parish. 94 cases in New Orleans and again a dozen of those at the Lambeth House house alone. He also mentioned another case that has made it over to Ascension Parish. Uh, we also did learn that Governor Edwards did activate the Louisiana National Guard to help uh, handle coronavirus testing sites and preparations. We do know that the Bayou Signet Park was shut down uh, so there can be a testing site and also drive through sites are being established. Something they discuss are being established in Orleans and Jefferson Parish. And we know that we have a lot of kids that are at home, college students as well and high school students. Um, who are uh, working from home or remotely learning from home. He did mention that the Louisiana Public Broadcasting will be changing their programming to provide more educational programming uh, for K through 12 students. A couple of other updates came through for us uh, as we were going through all of these news conferences, making sure we give you the latest information. If you did not notice this, Archbishop Amon, he has canceled all public mass stations of the cross and all gatherings that is effective immediately and indefinitely. Of 
course, due to social distancing, uh, distancing protocol. Also, we did hear um, some good news here. Saints uh, and Pelicans owner Gail Benson has donated $1 million in response to coronavirus, and that also has created a relief fund for arena workers. So we are still um, starting to hear some good trickle in, but again, in order for us to keep this from spreading, to flatten that curve, social distancing is the main practice. That is one of the reasons why uh, Mayor Latoya Cantrell has signed a proclamation to take further steps to create more social distance, distancing. So, of course, this is a call for severe actions effective tomorrow. Closures for all bars, nightclubs, and casinos. Restaurants will be required to end dine-in service and provide takeout and delivery only. drive through service will remain open. Closing all movie theaters and malls. They're closing gyms and health clubs. All high intensity frequent touch service spaces will close. And of course, they are also limiting all public gatherings altogether. They're also asking people, we have that list right there on your screen, also asking people, you know, this is from Donald President Trump a little bit earlier. Um, if you have uh, an event that is in your personal home and your personal space, um, try not to uh, exceed, oh, excuse me, that's from Mayor Latoya Cantrell's news conference. Try not to exceed the people who would normally be in your home. So if you have a home of five, try not to exceed that. Also, President Trump called for all Americans to not gather in groups of more than 10 and to go to school remotely. Work from home if you can. Again, something we're already doing here. Also, going to school from home and limit eating out and visiting shopping malls. All of this, of course, taking extreme precautions so that we could stop the spread of COVID-19. We're joined right now on the phone by Susan Haysig, uh, the Associate Professor of Epidemiology at uh, Tulane University uh, School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Uh, do you hear me, Dr. Haysig? Yes, I do. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we hear you OK. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, giving us and uh, we're seeing that the, the cases here are, are starting to grow in number. And this is something that, of course, um, leaders uh, nationwide, statewide and locally all expect it to happen. Do we think that we could see social distancing really kind of play a role in these cases dropping over the next couple of days? There won't be any change in the next couple of days in terms of the number of cases that are identified because those cases were acquired perhaps as long ago as two weeks ago. So what this social distancing effort now will do is reduce the number of cases we will find in a week or in two weeks. This is not something that instantaneously removes COVID infection from people who are already infected. And that's something that's really important to recognize. Well, earlier we heard uh, President Trump speaking about uh, everyone asking about a timeline here. Um, President Trump mentioned that some say July, some say we could see this slow down in August. Can we really uh, say when we will see this kind of so sort of downtrod here? No, we can't say certainly when that will happen. It all depends on how effective these social distancing efforts are and very clearly the more rigorous and aggressive they are the less transmission is likely to occur but as both the mayor and the governor have said the uh, participation of the community is incredibly important in this um, the reality is covid is a virus it doesn't just pop up in an environment it is transferred from one person to another person mm -hmm. and since we don't know who is infected at any given point in time and the science is telling us that people may be shedding or releasing virus even before they develop symptoms then we have to be separate well, Dr. Hasek, I, I know that we just heard uh, there from the governor that we have another case uh, at the Lambeth House, 12 cases. Um, is it sort of unusual for them to have a cluster? Is that something that we're going to see at other senior living facilities? It is not unusual at all. We have seen these kinds of clusters associated with flu and other norovirus, all sorts of infectious pathogens. And the really key thing is, as has been implemented, is to restrict the introduction and the interaction of residents in these long-term care facilities with people from the outside. 
so even employees will be screened before they enter to make sure they're not fever, they don't have a fever. Um, and so that's what's really, really important because we do not have a way to, you know, people don't suddenly have a little red flag with COVID on it popping out of their heads when they become infected. We can't tell who is carrying the virus. And that's why the restrictions are being placed with regard to healthcare facilities, with regard to long-term care facilities, with regard to any congregate, congregate settings that may have um, potentially vulnerable individuals in them. Well, Dr. Hasek, thank you so much for joining us, obviously. Uh, we will stay in touch with you and uh, in touch with everyone here that is watching on Eyewitness News. Uh, we continue to keep you updated, have given you news conferences from President Donald Trump, from Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards and uh, Mayor Latoya Cantrell, all of them basically emphasizing the same thing, social distancing, staying away from each other at least six feet is what could possibly let us see um, this curve really start to flatten when it comes to the spread of COVID-19. Okay, we'll continue to uh, follow along with this on Eyewitness News at 5, and that is coming up after this short break. Thank you so much for joining us. been injured in a car wreck, I want to help you. I want everyone in my firm to go the extra mile. That means returning your phone calls promptly. That means fighting hard to get you all the money you deserve. So if you've been injured in a car wreck, call me now. I have always wanted to do this. This is going to be awesome. Let's do this. Babe, what are you doing? Done and done with the bathroom. Who are you? The bath fitter installer, remember? Bath fitter custom made our new bath to fit perfectly over the old one, so there's no demo or mess. Impressive. Wait, so no demo? Sorry, man. Bath fitter will remodel your bath with no messy demolition in as little as one day. Call now or visit bathfitter.com for a free in home consultation. All across Louisiana, you'll find honest, hardworking people. But accidents happen and workers get hurt on the job. Injured workers have families to take care of and bills to pay. They're not looking for a handout, just a hand. That's why we're here. Dudley DeBosier will fight for the money you deserve for your injuries. If you've been hurt on the job, demand Dudley DeBosier. Call 444-4444. During the Rooms to Go anniversary sale, change the way you sleep forever. Choose your perfect mattress set at Rooms to Go. King or queen from the best brands. And switch your foundation to this top quality adjustable base for free. Just touch the button and get comfortable. Reading, working, together or apart for a more refreshing night's sleep. So make the switch to an adjustable base for free when you buy a great mattress set at the Rooms to Go anniversary sale. Dealing with the insurance company after a wreck is a nightmare. They'll do anything to get you the smallest settlement possible. Call us now. End this nightmare and we'll put you back on Dream Street. In a wreck, need a check? Call 3451111. Now handling jewel care.